Yes, sir. Well, I will convey a, a story. So it was like the end of last year, so about a year ago, I was driving and I was trying to get off on the west of the exit, and the truck was trying to um, dislodge a, a metal plate uh, into the road. And unfortunately, I ran over it. And uh, it punctured my gas tank. So after saying a few choice words, um, I had been called the police department, but it was they, they were out there right away, and very, very friendly. Um, and, and you know, obviously, help. Oh, the time I really needed that. Obviously, I had left a trail of gasoline all over the place. Yes, ma'am. Um, I have a, like two questions. Um, and one, I know you've got to deal with a lot and it's hard to, especially from like a lot of families, you know, we expect you guys to have all the answers and just do everything. A lot of times we don't even know what we want and we just sometimes direct all the anger at you because we're like, you're not doing this fast enough, you know, you don't have the answers for us and we want to make you mad. Um, which, you know, you, you guys do deal with a lot, so I do appreciate that. But um, one thing I did want to know was your unsolved cases. Um, do you guys have, I mean, how many are those? Do you guys have a lot of people to work on that? Or are they kind of just sitting back for right now? Since you said, like, the crime rate is down, um, and it is relatively safe, it's a lot safer here than a lot of other neighborhoods, so I didn't know if that means for more manpower to be able to open up those unsolved cases and be able to work on some of those if you guys are able to do that, have the resources to do that? Yes. Um, our I have meetings with our investigators just about every day, and they, starting last week, they have pulled five unsolved homicides out, case files, going back 30 years. Um, so they're they're assigning they're 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 assigning detectives to them, but it's a process to go through to send those back out for DNA processing. Um, genealogy, you know, ancestry stuff. So that's that can take a long time. But yes, they do go back and look for investigate unsolved crimes, especially crimes where we have some type of evidentiary value or leads that we can follow up on, which would be Is DNA. Have you had any success also? None that has culminated into an arrest, but some has we've identified suspects who are no longer alive um, that were in, that were involved in or a suspect that they would probably have enough probable cause to make an arrest if that was the case so yeah it's just it takes a long time to, to pull those out of the file and dust them, you know dust the boxes off and start over again because you're looking at it from a new perspective which is good but you're also looking at it a, a new detective is looking at it and he's looking at case notes from 30 years ago so it's it, it can be challenging but yes they do have they do have several homicide cases that they have reassigned to investigators to open up yeah, i know the dna over time can be damaged or things can be lost i understand that um but do they have those uh the cold cases specifically um have they went back and looked to see like hey these cases do have DNA follow-up leads, stuff like that. Do they take that DNA from those cold cases and then put it in a safe environment to kind of keep that DNA, um, you know, contained instead of it being, you know, just sitting there in the box until somebody picks it up? Are we, you know, do you have, are you able to do that? Yeah, all that stuff is down either in our evidence room or if it's some DNA that could be very fragile, it might already be at the crime lab and it may be already be at the lot for it may be at the crime lab and have been there for the last 20 years. So everything's marked, everything's secure. Some, some cold cases do not have any DNA. Right. And, you know, so that's even more challenging. I, um, I just asked because I do have family members that do have a lot of, you know, unsolved cases. Um, and I, this lady, Mariana Couch, she works for Who Killed Our Kids. Uh, a friend of mine, Brian Couch, her grandson, actually was shot and killed years ago. Uh, they never caught his murder or his murderer. Um, and 
they just, the organization and representatives from that, some family members went um, just recently down to the courthouse. I, I think they were working their way up or did go to the Supreme Court and also the um, some Cincinnati Police Department. Um, I know that's different stuff than you guys, but they did just plead with them and kind of just say, hey, you know, um, there's an overload here, like we've been waiting years to hear from family members, and it's a long time to go without that kind of closure or anybody looking at that case. And I know you guys can deal with a lot, but if you know anything you about it, as your family member, you're just like, it's only it's up to you to keep that case alive, you know? And it's, we're calling every day or every month or every year on the anniversary of the death, like, hey, remember my sister, remember my brother, my uncle, is anybody looking at this case? which I know can also be aggravating sometimes, but you know, when it's like, it, it, it's hard to kind of convey that and have somebody worry about it as if that's their family member, you know? And we do appreciate, I just want you guys to know, we do appreciate the time you take, everything that you do. Um, like you said, you're a member of this community, you know, you're no different, this is your, just a job. I mean, I know it's more than a job to you, but you're just the state, you live in this community, and you deal with things, you have your own life, your own kids, family issues, what have you, so um, you take the time to put your life on the line every day and, and protect us and, and give us the things that we need and we do appreciate that and value that. The second question I had was, um, I know you when you were reading the stats off, you said that the, um, the murders were down. So if there's a child, because I do remember when the, um, there was two 10-year-olds that had earlier in the year, one 10-year-old had killed the other one. Um, when it's a murder like that that involves two juveniles, is that on, the, on your stats? Does that go under murders or does that go under like a juvenile violence or juvenile records or something? Like how do you break that statistic? That would be classified, or that would be classified by how it's arraigned and how it's charged through the prosecutor's office. Okay. We haven't had any homicides this year. And typically, if you go back and you look at the statistics, when we, if you want to talk about homicides, we probably average one, maybe two a year. So we don't have very many. The, the, one, of the, the, one of the cold cases that you mentioned that we did open was probably the last homicide that we've had that we did not make an arrest on, and that was 2002. So what parts of Norwood would, um, I guess, I wonder is, are there certain parts of Norwood that you um, you count, at, like how far out would you say that they take those cases and account as like a Norwood first start as far as doing your statistics? We only have three square miles, so we have jurisdiction over everything that's in Norwood. So if there's a homicide in Norwood, then we would be investigating that. Anything outside of Norwood would be either Golf Manor or Cincinnati, Hamilton County Sheriff's Office. I know. But we have not had any homicides this year. This year. Does it rate like from January to December? Or well, it's January to now. Okay. Cool. And then the two that we had, I believe, last year, we they were not juveniles. Okay. And there was an arrest on both of them. So then it kicked over to like Gavin Dale probably. Possibly, yes. Okay. And Dave, have a question? Yeah, I wanted to follow up on the cruise. If I wanted to write you a check tonight, which I don't, but <laughs> <laughs> how much would a cruiser cost? That's a good question. They get, expen they get ex more expensive every year. And a, cru a cruiser plus everything outfitted and ready to go is about $71,000. And that's for a Dodge Durango now. So we're, we're changing over from Ford Explorers to Dodge Durango. And maybe we'll just end on, do you have safety tips for us maybe um, as far as kids playing on their own, walking on their own, um, maybe pedestrian safety like bikes and stuff, and park safety, something like that. Just tips, general tips for... Normally we're always in the parks. So, you know, if your kids are playing in the parks, you know, have them come up, see us, we're there. Um, Pedestrian safety, just, you know, we know that there's a crosswalk and a lot of people think that as long as they walk across the street that they have the right of way, which probably they do, but tell them to wait until it says walk and then don't walk when it says don't walk. <laughs> um, that does, it gets problematic sometimes. 
<laughs> yeah, oh, right. Um, but for the auto thefts, um, I will say this, you know, if you do carry a handgun, don't leave it in your car, period. Just don't do it. That's why these people are breaking into cars to begin with. If it's there, they're going to take it. We recover stolen guns all the time, and it's always stolen from Springdale, all over the place. And it's because they, they get comfortable and they, they get lazy, and, but they need to be responsible. And leaving your car, leaving your handgun inside of your car, whether it's locked or unlocked, it's not very responsible. Because someone's going to break into it, and they're going to steal it, and we don't want it to be used in a crime. Yes. Or on the side. I have one more question. For you. Yeah. Shoot. Is there anything? I know you're like, God, get her out of here. Um, I just want to know: Is there anything you guys need from us, like your community, that you need from us? If you see something, say something. Mm -hmm. You know, we're there. Our, we, we, we're, we're always big on our response time, you know, within a minute, if it's an emergency, within a minute or two minutes, we're going to be at your front door. Um, so if you see something, say something. You may not get the result that you want, but we will definitely look into it and, and to make sure. And there's a non-emergency line, right? That we yes. Right yeah. Um, yeah. Non-emergency line, emergency line, if you get on our website, that Ms. Hoover's always complaining to us that it's not up to date, but it is up to date. So there are there, there are bullet points. You can you can anonymous drug lines, abandoned vehicles. If you just want to to anonymously type something that you see, we will follow up with it. All of our command staff gets those emails coming in, and then we delegate it out for for follow up. Um, just some of the kids that I know, they're the things that go on, you know, they have like a no snitch policy and we, I was growing up in that. Um, and I know it makes it very hard for you guys to do your job and it's like, you guys won't tell us nothing, but you want us to magically have the answers, you know, so I know that gets very frustrating, but, um, is there anything that you would have me tell them, like, you know, that it's okay to just call, they will not have your name, like, is there anything I can tell them? from your perspective that would ease it on the community to go ahead and speak and just... They can always remain anonymous. Um, what, 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 what is the frustrating part about that, it's not that it's the no snitch mentality, it's you're always gonna have a victim that's never gonna have justice because somebody doesn't feel like they wanna report something. Okay. And then you said, you know, you have a victim that you're, that's never going to get justice or never going to have closure on what happened because people don't want to talk. And if it was, if the shoe was on the other foot, they would probably talk. So yes, anybody can call. They can remain anonymous. Um, they can, if they want to meet, they can meet. We can meet, always meet in a private place. Your information doesn't have to go out there. There's, there's so many channels that you can reach us that we can coordinate. On a, with a one-on-one -on -one meeting, so no one, no one will have to know. All right. Thanks, everybody. That was a good question. Thank you. On the uh, question, uh, I want to give a shout out to Susan, who's been working with Xavier University on the like those tiny little annoyances um, with uh, partying and stuff like that, and parking. And so it's funny now as an adult, and I don't know, like a community member like this, I'm kind of excited about the parking tickets. I'm like, yeah, get those people not parking so close to the corners and making our school drop off difficult. So I actually, actually very much appreciate what you're doing. I do want to say just a quick little thing um, about the connectedness um, and how that's so great with Norwood. Um, another councilwoman, Candace Winterbauer, and I have been working with improving the uh, relationship with Xavier um, renter students. Uh, and uh, one of our police officers is, uh, he calls himself a, a Xavier alum as he works there. And he is good friends with one of the officers from Xavier. So that friendship that predates all of this uh, is what facilitated um, what are now these uh, joint patrols. And so they did a big blitz um, the first weekend that the kids were, were in and they did make 11 citations. And then the following week, I believe it was two or three, and then the week after, it was none. So they really were um, letting the message be known, reminding folks to be good neighbors. Uh, it will be happening again uh, for Halloween parties. And there was also just a really lovely grill and chill that Cappy's did with uh, 
the Xavier police and the Norwood officers, and it was a great opportunity for students and uh, long-term residents to get together. The Xavier kids were all in costume, um, so it was just a really fun event. But there's a lot of those sorts of connections happening, and most of those are because of personal relationships. So I think that's, for me, that's my favorite part about Norwood. Yes, for sure. I love hearing that so much. We love our Xavier neighbors. They are babysitters and dog sitters, and um, one of them mowed our lawn frequently, and, and it's just really a great relationship. So, uh, Chief McCabe, you're up. Our fire department has amazingly fast response time. It's very impressive. We had a call for uh, a, a gas leak that I was concerned about, and they brought our kids helmets and didn't even make me feel dumb for the fact that we did not have a gas leak. I, I don't need that. All right. I got a pretty good So, thank you. My, my name's Tom McCabe. I've been the fire chief uh, of Norwood since I was in an acting role from uh, August of 2019. And then I was sworn in as the official chief April 1st of 2020, right into the pandemic. So that was fun. We always, uh, the previous chief before me, he took office and had the giant flood of Norwood. So I always say, whoever takes chief after me, good luck. But I'm actually the 12th fire chief uh, for the fire department. So 100, over 100 years old. Um, and I'm the first non Norwood native to be the fire chief. So I was actually hired in 2000. Um, like Chief Summer said, it was Norwood was very much a uh, very inclusive community in terms of it was all Norwood, and so outsiders. I grew up in uh, Wyoming, went to Wyoming High School, graduated in '92, um, so I didn't know much about Norwood. And when I got hired in 2000, there was a requirement that you had to live in Norwood for your first five years. So my first house was on Ivanhoe Avenue. Um, around some lovely Xavier students as well. Um, and then I, I moved up to Wakefield Place, and I re in both houses I remodeled and then sold off, and um, I since moved out to Claremont County. Um, so Norwood's a great spot when you look at it, and if you look at Norwood from my perspective as being an outsider, it was very welcoming. Um, as a community has definitely changed over the last 25 years in terms of the, the amount of new people who have moved into Norwood. Norwood was very much a Norwood generation. You know, people born and raised here, they never left. And the influx of, uh, of new people to Norwood has been, has been interesting and um, has driven a lot of, of significantly good, good things for Norwood. So, um, a little bit about the fire department. We have 54, excuse me, 53 members. We are fully staffed. We actually had our la last opening filled on Monday. Um, so, yeah, we're very lucky. Uh, we run uh, three shifts. Guys work 24-hour shifts, and then they're off two days. The platoons are, are staffed with 16 guys. You rarely will see 16 on duty uh, a day because of vacations or holidays or whatever, but we do have some where we have 16. Um, our fire station runs two fire engines, one ladder truck, and then two paramedic units. Fun fact for you guys is to get up two paramedic units are out transporting patients. Both fire engines are set up to provide advanced life support or paramedic care. There's always a paramedic on each of one of those. You'll even maybe get a paramedic on the ladder truck, but let's hope they're not making EMS runs on the ladder truck. Uh, we make about 40, 400 runs a year. Uh, that's a pretty good amount of runs for a community three square miles. Uh, we, are, we are seeing our run volume kind of level off. If you look at historically how our run volume has gone over the last 20 years, it's been a steady climb. COVID was an odd year and it dropped. And then uh, 21, we, we started to climb back up. Last year we kind of level off and we kind of maintained that level. So it's interesting to see. A lot of times we, we equate that to socioeconomic changes, which are certainly happening within this community. Um, Sometimes it's better education about health resources, and uh, we, we fully try to help our community members understand what 911 is for. Um, that, that's been a, a, a big talking point for sure. So, from a, from a fire department perspective, in terms of our safety tips, we're getting ready to change the clocks, right? And what we always been taught in school: any right? time to change your clock, change your batteries and your smoke detector. So. Everyone put your hands up for me, okay? We're gonna, we're gonna do a little, we're a little fun, fun time. How many of you have smoke detectors in your house? 
All right? If you don't have it, put your hand down. How many of you have a smoke detector on all three floor, every floor of your home? If you don't, put your hand down. Okay? Yep, base was a big one. Okay. How many of you change your batteries out every time the clock changes? <laughs> okay. Now here's here's the big one. How many of you know that smoke detectors have an expiration date on them? Good. That's enormous. That's a, that's been a big push for a fire department. Ten years. Ten years is a, a big deal. Now I will say this. The advent of the lithium-ion batteries with smoke detectors has been a game changer in terms of you don't need to change those out. If you have smoke detectors with lithium-ion batteries, they're good for the life of the detector, generally speaking. Um, you know, most of you live in homes that have gas-fired appliances, whether it's a stove, furnace, hot water heater. Make sure you have a carbon monoxide detector. And I always tell people the most important place to have that is in the sleeping areas. Wherever you lay your uh, head at, that's the height that your, that your CO detector should be mounted on the wall, whether it's on a nightstand near you. Um, in my house, we have one in the hallway about yay high, and then in my bedroom, I have one right at uh, head level. Carbon monoxide just is ambient with air. It doesn't, doesn't sound like propane and go to the bottom. It's not like, uh, I don't know, smoke or goes to the top generally. It just floats to the house. So we always say you're most susceptible to carbon monoxide when you're sleeping. So mount it at that height. Um, lithium, lithium ion batteries, uh, we talked about this a little bit in 19, but it's an extremely dangerous topic in terms of the advent of Chinese made mobility devices. So if your kid wants that scooter for Christmas, that's great. Don't ever leave it plugged in in the house. Don't ever let it charge overnight. Plug it in in the area where you can watch it unplug it, take it out. Scooters or, or bikes, never have those in the house charging, especially in areas where block your exit. Um, they are extremely dangerous. You see on the news in, in New York City where you know, they had multiple fatality fire in an apartment building because of that. Now I'll tell you, it's not just New York City. Just last year in Union Township, Claremont County, in an apartment building, someone had a, a mobile scooter that plugged in in their hallway and they had a fire and they died because of that location. They're extremely dangerous. Um, if you buy one from a reputable manufacturer within uh, the United States and you know where that battery has come from, they have battery management systems in there, so they turn off like your iPhone. And that's a good, that's a great, uh, you know, even though it's not made uh, in the United States, I, Apple has a really good battery management system, which basically, when you feel it get hot, you know, if you put it in your car and you see, pick it up, it's really hot, and it says, can't use, that's because it's unsafe mode. It's not allowing it to utilize any of that battery space. It's not allowing it to charge, because that's when those things take off, it's extremely dangerous. And you won't have time. If a lithium ion battery goes into, we call thermal runaway, and lights off, it will be an enormous fire in less than a minute. Um, especially the, the larger the batteries you look at with those mobility devices like the scooters or the hoverboards, those are dangerous. So those things look great on Amazon, they're super cheap because we're getting them for Christmas. I would rethink that. Um, so our fire department not only does fire and EMS, obviously, but we also do fire inspections. We have two full-time fire inspectors who work. Um, predominantly, they're, they're charged with inspecting all of our commercial businesses. Um, there are a number of industrial sites that they have to get into. Um, we do those annually. Um, your fire department does inspect college homes. So those of you who live near, um, you know, Xavier Rentals, we actually get into those and in inspect those to make sure that the students are being safe. Had a little bit of pushback from some of the landlords because they're worried about their, you know, we're out there trying to target how much money they're making and we don't care. We tell them it's a, this is a, a safety net for you. That's not, you know, cross that liability piece off if you, you want. But if you're single family, you can always call the fire department and say, hey, we'd like a fire inspection. We'll do that. Obviously, if you're ever interested in adopting a child, that's a state law requirement. The fire department comes out and does an inspection for you. Um, what's new at the firehouse? We're, obviously, our, our stuff is really expensive. Um, that fire truck you saw tonight as you walked in, that was bought in 2009. That fire truck cost $335,000 in 2009. We bought an identical truck to that 
in 2021, $650,000. And so your council graciously approved a purchase of another fire truck, which we just signed paperwork on. We won't get it until 2028, probably. That was over $900,000. So fire trucks have gone, well, I equate to rapidly increasing in price, like Norwood housing stock. Um, it's, it's been insane. We, we, we don't know if it's partly supply chain. It's definitely labor costs in terms of there's not enough people doing the jobs, um, but it's across the board. So our next enormous purchase is gonna be a ladder truck. And I thought I was being really, really smart when I did my first capital plan and put $1.2 million in for a ladder truck. And that's less than half of what a ladder truck will cost nowadays. So, yeah, it's expensive. Public safety is really, really expensive. Um, but you get what you pay for, so uh, Norwood's a very, you know, lucky community in the fact that we're small. Um, we can get to places really fast, but we're in an urban environment. We're, we're basically, if you see a city of Cincinnati fire station, that's what Norwood is, or other places. We're, we're very similar in terms of that kind of response. Um, so yeah, we got we got a lot of stuff coming up. We're, we're asking uh, city council for for lots and lots, but we're we're always on the uh, on the prowl for grants or uh, trying to see how we can we can shave costs. It's a uh, it's a daunting task sometimes uh, because unfortunately the the things that you absolutely have to have to provide the services that we provide they just they cost a lot of money and you, you stamp it as public safety and then sometimes it seems like it makes it even more expensive. Any questions? Can you speak to, uh, it seems like, it does seem like it has stopped for a bit, but there was a little bit of time where there's a lot of porch fires happening. Uh, yeah. I know you said it wasn't right. suspicious, but are there any like uh, tips that we can know? So, so it, we had a rash of a lot of fires. Amazingly, of those, only one was deemed suspicious. Um, and we actually arrested the police, uh, well, the arson investigation team, made an arrest on that, which was fantastic. Um, <laughs> You know, porch fires, there's a number of things. If you're a smoker, discard your smoking materials appropriately. Don't put them in a flower pot, which was one of our fire porch fires, that happens. Um, don't leave candles unattended. You know, that's inside the house. That's one of the largest causes of the structure fires in the United States, is unattended, unattended candles burning. Um, you know, I, I guess the, the biggest takeaway I will tell you from the fires that we're seeing now is how rapid they burn and how fast they get ahead of us. Um, for those that know the Pachudas, that house was, the, I was shocked. I was out of town when I came and came back in town and, and toured the house. I was flabbergasted about the amount of damage because we had made that, we, had, we were on the scene less than three and a half minutes from that phone call to us being on the scene. And the amount of damage inside the house was absolutely amazing and, and the amount of fire that was showing when the guys pulled up was ridiculous and the problem is it's because of, of what your stuff in your house is made of it's all it's all oil based you know polystyrenes um polyurethanes and those things have rapid burn rates and they put out a lot of btus so it's their fires are hotter and they're very fast so it makes smoke detectors even more important you guys have a really good safety plan in terms of how you're going to leave your house. So. Yes? I want to say thank you very much. I've been waiting for you. Um, you guys, firemen saved my life, my family's life. Um, so I really greatly and deeply appreciate what you do. You guys saved my grandfather when he got electrocuted um, back in the 90s. And then my house burned down in 2005. We lost everything. We were five kids, two adults. Um, like you said, I was going to bring up and ask you if you've seen that. Our house burned down so fast. We were putting addition on the back of the house. Um, this happened in Bridgetown on Childs Avenue. It was dead of winter. Um, my sister was a newborn baby. And I don't know if you guys talked to the kids about this, but I always heard, you know, when you guys come talk to the kids at the schools, you say, touch the door if it's hot, you know, like don't open it, stuff like that, put stuff under the door. But I had never heard, clearly my mother didn't, um, or she was just frantic. Um, but I was, everybody was asleep. I was in the kitchen, I woke my mom up. I saw a bunch of black fog on the ground and it was coming from the outside, like where they were doing the addition. 
And I woke my mom up. She's like, uh, you're tripping. Like, go back to bed. You're seeing shit. I said, Mom, no, seriously, wait, there's something out here. She comes out, black fog, immediately opens up the sliding glass doors that are pitch black. As soon as she did, the oxygen, everything went up in flames. I mean, it was, I don't even, it seemed like seconds. You know, like we lost everything. And I went back, I have scars on my arms this day. When I went back in the house, me and my sister to go get the, sh the shoes and the jackets for my siblings. When we tried to go back, the top, the back had already burned. The top of the house was burning and the floors were, had already, they were, it was eating up the floors and it had moved to the, to the basement already. So we don't recommend going back to the house that you borrowed Of course, yeah. This, this but do you guys ever um, like, talk to the kids about stuff like that or like the oxygen and how we, fast we that is? We robust uh, juvenile program in terms of we got a fire prevention piece. COVID kind of killed most of that. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's, it's really hard to get that back into the school system and, and take that time. You know, state testing is real. Like teachers, having teachers have time to, to have that message because we know it's really important from years five to year the eight. The Mormon Story School has a field trip to the yes. firehouse. Yeah, and so we, we've always done that. You know, <laughs> I approved it. <laughs> we, we've, all, we've always encouraged the schools to, to come to the fire station. Um, you know, we, we yes, yeah, but you know, that's, I always tell people that's your fire station. Come visit, you know, come knock on the door, talk to the guys, see the trucks. That's yours. That is your place. We always, we always want you to come and see what, what your uh, fire service looks like. When my grandfather was electrocuted, the, the firemen were up in the cherry picker. He was power washing the building. It was raining. When he touched it, he obviously was electrocuted. They could not get, get him down, obviously, because electricity trailers. But I wonder, um, I, I highly doubt because the, he's like, the anytime they hear it on the West Side, they know it's my grandfather, that, you know, because you never hear about that. He survived, um, but they cut his arm off. He had three fingers, and the electricity blew some of his toes off, and he had 127 skin grafts. Um, he was never the same, obviously, and up surviving that to die of pancreatic cancer. But um, do you, is there anything that you guys are taught now to keep you guys safe? Do they implement anything like that to help you guys for something like electricity or somebody that, is there anything to help you guys deal with that? Oh, uh, actually, Duke Energy's got a great program where they come out and they talk about the dangers of electricity because we're around all the time. We don't, we don't get to pick and choose. Um, the, the fire, they talked about the Pachuta fire, when the guys pulled up, the, the electric service that house was on the ground, live, dancing in the front yard to play with a snake. So it's, it's real, but yeah, we have Duke Energy in every year. They talk to the guys at all three shifts. Um, we have both gas and electric come in and do that, that presentation. It's, it's fantastic. Um, you know, no, not really, no. It's, that's a very specialized thing. And you start talking about the regulations that are put in place for, just the lamb and gloves are ridiculous in terms of the testing they go through, the certification process after use. So no, we, we don't. Because generally, if it's live, we, there's ways we could meet, you know, mitigate it. We generally let it, we let it, let it go. So obviously, if there's a life in danger, we will do everything we possibly can to, to figure that out. Uh, that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I, had, I was wondering at what point a gas issue in a building becomes not Duke's problem, but your guys' problem? Well, it's always Duke's problem. Always Duke's problem. It's always Duke's problem. <laughs> <laughs> However, uh, it's, so we, we always tell people, smell it, yeah. call. Mm -hmm. there, there's a reason. So Mercaptan is the, the odorant they put in natural gas. Um, you would be surprised. It's basically a bottle dropper that takes care of enough gas that would fill this room. It's just one drop out of that bottle dropper. Crazy story. Um, they had a tank car overturn in Virginia that was full of my captain. The cleaning crew that came in to mitigate that after it was all over, when they were done, because they stayed in the hotel, when they're done, they bulldozed the hotel because they couldn't get the smell. Oh my God. It's real. So if you smell that, there's a reason why it's in there. Call the fire department, right? We'll come out. We've got pretty sophisticated meters where we can smell what's going on. Um, you know, there are times where you're going to see in Norwood, there's a vent on the side of your house where the system will burp, right? If you're outside and you catch a whiff, you may not need to call the fire department right then, but if you smell it sustained, 
absolutely call us. If you ever smell it inside your house, call us. It's, uh, we can identify what's going on at a minimum. We can turn the gas to off your house until you can figure it out. Yeah. You mentioned how dangerous lithium-ion batteries are, and of course everything I own is lithium-ion batteries. Uh, so, other than make sure you're not charging them where you're blocking ingress, egress, and not charging them while you're out and about or asleep, do you have any tips, like, if one catches on fire? Like, can I use my regular fire extinguisher, or is that going to make it worse? Or should I use it? Or should I use a fire blanket, or should I just... So, yes. But, yeah, so, if you have a fire blanket, throw it on top of it, call us, we'll deal with it. The, the problem with fire, well, lithium ions is, um, if you know the construction, it's basically, think of, think of a wrapping paper. And that paper is individual lithium cells, and then you roll it up. So as one cell goes off, the next one goes off, and it's so tightly packed, it takes a long time. I'll, I'll tell you, this guy will never own a lithium ion vehicle like a Tesla because they're sick. I mean, if you look at the stats between electric car fires and the amount of gasoline car fires we have, gasoline car fires are predominantly more, even if you take it down to a per capita piece. However, if, they're, if your Tesla catches on fire, it's going to burn. It's going to burn for a long time. The fire department actually has a policy where we will elect to let it burn potentially because there's no way for us to get water cooling agent to extinguish that battery from the inside out. You can't puncture them because it makes it worse. It's, uh, it's not awesome. You know, I'm, we're, we're trying to advocate for some pretty restrictive EV charging policies in terms of like Factor 52. If they build a multi-residential place and they've got underground parking, we don't really want to see that kind of charging system underneath a residential piece because while the, while the risk for it to actually occur as low, it's still a risk. And so I, I always caution people, lithium ion batteries in general, the small ones, you're, you're pretty safe. It's the ones, that, the ones that you have to think about. If you, and if you damage it, leave it outside. There are recycling areas you can look up in the Hammond County uh, solid waste piece. Never put those in your uh, recycling place. Don't put any batteries in your recycling. Just so you guys know, the recycling plant is in St. Bernard. And when it catches fire, we go over there for that. So, and it happens a lot. So yeah, it happens a lot. It's unfortunately, um, they do a really good job trying to separate that stuff. Yes. Not really. Any other tips? Don't don't be overly scared about it. It's more about mouth, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Just just be, be knowledgeable about it. I, I, so I have lithium ion uh, batteries for my power tools. I have lithium ion for uh, a few of my my gardening pieces. But I will tell you. When I charge them, they charge in a separate rack in the center of the garage with nothing else around them. And when they're not in use, they're in a metal ammo can that sits on my... That's... It, it'll help a little bit, but this... I don't keep it around stuff that can burn either. All right, well, I know I have other questions too, but for the sake of time, we're going to go ahead and um, stop the questions for, for Chief McKay. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. Thank you guys. Um, one of the super cool things about our just a 3.1 square mile town is I'm sure you don't get inundated with too many emails, so a few more from us if you have questions, I think we'll be accepted. Uh, you can also find them on Facebook, both fire department and police department are on there. Uh, recommend following them. You can get uh, information or you can get updates and information and contact them uh, via Messenger. Um, Pam from the health department was unfortunately not able to make it. We do have a fantastic health department. They've got leaf bags um, for free uh, lawn cleanup um, that gets picked up and, and uh, Norwood actually gets credit for uh, any um, anything diverted from the rumpy trash pickup. So if you have uh, yard waste bags, which you can pick up for free, or if you have recycling, we get credit for all that, which is, is pretty cool. So there's some incentive to, to keep it out of the landfill. Our, our city benefits from that. And um, I wish I knew more about the health department resources, but she was going to be the one saying that. So look at the website. It's got a lot of detail. It's a very helpful. Um, helpful department that that we have um, you can get your birth certificates there and um, just really friendly people and and accessible um, and then we have one in five which is going to come uh if, oh, 
There you are, sorry, I was looking at Jess back there. Um, one of the very cool things about Norwood Schools is our emphasis on mental health, and I'm enjoying your squeegee ball right now. Uh, mental health at Norwood Schools is really fantastic, and they're gonna tell us a little bit more about all kinds of things and also how they work in schools. Well, thank you. Yeah, and, and I know we're, uh, time is precious, so I won't take up too much of your time, but we just wanted to say thank you for having us here tonight. Um, my name is Sarah Utech, I'm the school program director, and my colleague Jess is back there in the back at the table. We have all kinds of resources, including the squishy little brains that you picked up, little stress balls, take two. <laughs> Broke this. Um, one in five has been around for about 15 years. We're a nonprofit. Um, we actually were founded by a woman named Nancy Eigel Miller. Um, coincidentally, her husband worked at Xavier University for many years, and Jim died by suicide. And uh, kind of like all of us, when something really jarring and tragic um, and sudden happens in our lives, we want to do what we can, right, to take that. Um, to take that pain and channel it into something positive. And to Nancy's credit and her, her daughters and, and their family and friends, they created one in five. And fast forward to today, we are in, um, gosh, almost 200 different schools in Southwest Ohio and in Northern Kentucky. We also do a lot in the community space. We're actually doing quite a bit with fire department, uh, fire and police departments with um, QPR, the Red Alert trainings. Uh, we're also uh, just out and about in the community, and everything we do is about suicide prevention and mental health education. So we like to say, you know, we're all about starting the conversation and working to stop the stigma. So, you know, thank you to those of you who are on school boards and affiliated with um, schools and community groups and workplace wellness sort of initiatives, too. We really have to um, create time to talk about this stuff. Being a human being is hard. It's messy, right? There's a lot of stuff that we need to be aware of and on the lookout for, including each other, right? And um, especially what we do in the schools is really get in as early as we can to talk to the kids about feelings. You know, feelings are um, telling us things, right? They're not good or bad. They might be comfortable and uncomfortable, but gosh, it's okay to feel things, right? So we talk to the kids about that and we work with the teachers and help them learn skills and strategies for how to navigate kind of the tough stuff. We'll come into schools um, and work with families, right, and do parent nights. And, and so it kind of runs the gamut, but we've got a table in the bag, we've got all kinds of resources, and if we can be of support to any of you, personally, professionally, that's what we're happy to do. We um, really believe in prevention. That's really critically important. Anytime we can start the conversation about any of this stuff that we talked about tonight, um, that's what we're here for. So thank you, thank you, thank you for giving me a few seconds to kind of get up here, but please visit us. We've got resources back in the back, and we hope to see you again um, another time. So thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you guys all for coming. Grab some food to go. Um, socialize with each other. We've got school board, remember. We've got Nora Together representatives you can talk to. Chief Sumner is still here. Um, so, and Nora Community Television is a great resource, and they're here as well. So if you have any questions for um, any of those people or just enjoying neighbors, and definitely look at the literature back there. Uh, the Rec Center also has some flyers back on that table. So uh, check it all out and enjoy. Happy fall, everyone.